looks like we're slowing down on entering people into the room. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hello, and good afternoon. My name is Samantha Deutsch. I am the digital art history lead at the Frick Art Reference Library. And we are very grateful today to have Louisa Wood Ruby, who is the executive director of Pharos, the International Consortium of Photo Archives, to give us a workshop on using Pharos and digital art history. Um, just a little background, Louisa and I go back a, a ways. <laughs> I won't give you how long, but we've been cooking up digital art history projects and exploring things together for a really long time. And I'm just grateful to have her here. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Louisa now. Welcome. Oh, wait, sorry. Caveat, Louise, I forgot to mention. <laughs> um, if you have questions for Louisa today, please put it in the Q&A, and I will be adding some links and things into the chat for everybody um, as they are needed. Okay, now take it away, Louisa. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, so I can't see you all, but anyway, I'm so glad you're all here. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, hopefully. Um. And as Samantha said, I am the executive director of Pharos, the International Association of Photo Archives. We have um, moved from a consortium to an association. We are a legal 5013C um, as of, I think, 20, 2021. Um, so we can now get money from <laughs> grant making institutions, which is, of course, very useful. Um, the idea for Pharos was hatched at the Frick um, in 2013. Uh, here's a lovely photo of everyone from 14 um, art historical research institutions at the Frick um, uh, at an event that was um, supported by the Crest Foundation, thankfully. And they are also, as you see, Max Marmer here, for those of you who know him. Um, and at that time, we formulated a common goal, the 14 institutions that were there, to create um, an online um, platform that would aggregate and align both the data and the images from all of these 14 institutions, which we estimated would be 25 million images eventually if we all got everything online. Um, this platform, we knew as art historians and photo archivists, would provide a place for sometimes forgotten images uh, to come together and allow researchers to use them very easily, um, but not only just to see them and to see this curated metadata, but to use new technologies that, have, that are coming out um, every day to search these images and their related metadata in new and different ways and to serve a digital audience. So at the time, uh, we decided to use linked open data. Um, eventually, we came around to using computer vision, which is, of course, very useful for uh, images of works of art. Um, and linked open data, for those who don't know, is a set of design principles for sharing machine-readable intellect data on the web um, so that it's possible to combine and query this data. This means that once a Pharos institution has converted their metadata attached to its photo archive records um, using RDF in a CDOC CRM ontology, um, the data set can automatically be linked not only to the data sets of the other institutions, but also to external open databases that are in linked data format, um, such as the Getty vocabularies uh, the Deutsche National Bibliothek, um, the Virtual International Authority file, and Wikidata, um, and also Library of Congress for that matter. Uh, this becomes very useful because a lot of the information is held in these particular authority files is not included in the photo archive records of the individual institutions. So once you're mixing um, the, the these these open data sets with the data sets from the institutions, you get a much rit richer overall data set. Uh, Pharos decided to use research space uh, software, which was first developed by the British Museum and supported by the um, Paul Mellon Foundation. By using the tools uh, that research space is offered, it's possible to combine and query the data on the platform to ask novel questions about artworks, artists, photographers, collections, and the history of photography. For photo archives, while they document works of art, 
of course, um, and show actual photographs. They These photographs are taken by actual photographers that have histories and biographies themselves. And indeed, the project has already proved useful for the 14 original institutions to take a look at how and why their collections were formed, the biases that were inherent in their early collecting practices, as well as in the discipline of art history as a whole. And, and these are issues that are um, topics of interest to scholars, both of art history and photography. Um, we've always uh, had the, since the very beginning meeting, the goal of bringing on new photo archives uh, once the platform is up and running and we have a good system of ingesting new data sets, um, of bringing on institutions with photographs of works of art uh, from around the world. And thus uh, the site, uh, we, we thought of this in 2013, which I'm quite proud of because it's become more uh, of a strong goal in most cultural heritage institutions uh, more recently, but we really determined at that time that, um, you know, this was needed to bring the art of the world around into one combined database such as this using all these new technologies. Um, so in spring of 2019, we applied uh, and successfully for a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to fund a 30 month pilot project to create a beta platform using the research space plat uh, software. So this uh, platform here, which um, later on I will uh, demonstrate and give you the URL for, um, is, um, is, is what was the result of this pilot project. Um, for the pilot project, um, we were able to ingest the data of seven of the 14 institutions. You see them here. Bibliothek Herziana, Bild Archiv Foto Marburg, Fondazione Zeri, the Frick, Itati, Kunsthistorisch Institute in Florence, and the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art. Um, initially, we had only uh, told the Mellon we would do five institutions, but we were able to bring the seven on, which is half of the total, which um, we're very, you know, we were very excited about. Um, and so this is, again, a picture of the site. You can see on the right that it is um, a beta release um, and that it is not in full production mode yet. Um, on the lower right is a sort of disclaimer saying that uh, not all of the data is correctly aligned because as you can imagine, having um, 11,000 photographers' names, 8,000 repositories, 113, um, uh, 2.8 million images that document 1.7 million works of art, um, there needs to be a lot of reconciliation work done. And that was not part of the original project. Um, so that it work is now ongoing. Um, and we are working on a, a, a new site. Um, and... Um, so when you use this site, uh, and you are able to use this site, Samantha is now going to put the site URL, which you see on the upper left here, um, into the chat, artresearch.net. You will get log, it's a, it's a login site, and the um, the, the uh, login is demo, and the password is Pharos demo, one word. Um, you're welcome to look at it. You're welcome to play with it. Do know, though, as I said, that it's... Um, that it is, it is a pilot project and it needs a lot of work, which it is currently undergoing. Um, and in order to do this work, uh, which we knew after we did the pilot project, we did apply for a level three digital humanities advancement grant um, from the National Endowment of the Humanities last year. Uh, which we were awarded, which we're very excited about, with a matching grant from the Crest Foundation, um, who once again came through for us. In the meantime, in the past 10 years, the Crest had not only supported that first meeting, but also our work on a computer, on um, a visual search tool, which you will see in a moment. And they also supported our um, meeting in 2020 at the Paul Mellon Center in London, um, to work on IP issues, which is very important, obviously, for a site with all of these images. Um, that, uh, that, that particular meeting brought together lawyers from the three jurisdictions that are currently involved in the Farrell site. So 
the United States, the UK, and uh, European, uh, the at Europe, and um, talked about all the different issues, legal issues that were involved with copyright of images in the various um, jurisdictions. And it was very, very useful for us. Out of that, um, a, a group called Glam E um, has come out, and they are working on um, creating copyright. Uh, formulas for institutions who want to post their images online um, based on the jurisdictions that they're in. So it's it's obviously a very important um, topic for cultural heritage institutions, one which in 2013 when we started, we completely uh, bypassed because we knew at that time there was not enough information and people weren't sort of bold enough to really deal with, with, with these issues yet at that time. But now the time has come where they're really coming out into the fore and a lot is going on with that. Um, the NEH grant and the CREST grant will allow us to bring the site to production and publication level by updating the back end, redoing the simple search, creating a new back button. That's one of the big bugaboos about this site. The research space um, software uh, doesn't have a, a very good back button. And we're all used to a certain ways of searching sites these days. And um, we're all very used to Google, obviously, um, and the and going back a page, et cetera. And it does, sometimes it works, but not all the time. I mean, there's a lot of little bugs like that that you'll find when you go on. Um, it will also perform site level reconciliation, as I mentioned, improve the scalability of the site because as we bring on new images, I mentioned we have 2.5 million, 2.8 million now. Um, you know, we anticipate tens of millions eventually, especially as we bring on new collections. Um, and in general, fixing all the problems that we um, encountered. And things have been going quite well on that background uh, redo at the moment. Um, we did start the NEH grant in last um, fall in November. Um, and we are hoping to have something to show the public in um, this fall of, it's not gonna be still finished because it's a three year grant. Um, so for an updated site, please check back with me in the fall, um, I think Samantha's going to put my email in the chat. You're welcome to talk to me. Um, so anyway, um, I'm going to just show you the current site as it stands um, to show you the kinds of things that you can do now on it and the kinds of things that will be easier and better and faster on the new site. Um, the first thing to know, which I, I sort of mentioned, is that the search bar here um, is not an element it's a simple search, um, but it is not something, again, that the research space software, we found a lot to be missing from the research space software, and our engineers had to um, come up with a way of making a simple search work at all on Faro. So these are the kinds of difficult technical problems that, that we've had. Um, when you're working in research space, you use something called a search builder, and you go to a page something like this, and you find um, these categories that all of the data on the site have been uh, divided up into. So work, artist, photograph, photo, photographer, and the repository. And so to show you how that works, um, I did a simple search and I looked at a work created by a student of an artist, and I put in Rembrandt Van Rijn, um, and a work has type, this is kind of very CDOC CRM um, language. Um, that's the Council of International uh, Museums Art Heritage um, Ontology. It's a big mouthful, but it's a way of uh, it's a it's an agreed upon um, language, if you will, uh, of of that cultural heritage institutions can use. Um, when they're uploading their data to link to, to into linked open data sets. Um, so it was a, um, a work created by a student of Rembrandt as a type of drawings. So the um, site gave me back 104 matches. Um, you could filter further here. Um, you can see all the different ways you can filter. Um, and you see it's a title. The creator is Nicholas Moss, who was Rembrandt's student. Um, you can see where the, the drawing was, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, in a normal search on a normal photo archive website, you could put in, you know, Rembrandt. If you put in drawing, if you put in student of Rembrandt, it probably wouldn't come up. Or if you put in the word drawing, you might come up with uh, a record that had drawing in 
a field completely other than, you know, the type of materiality of the object you were looking for. So this really gets you, allows you to make a very granular and accurate search um, that is not possible on a, in other databases. Um, so let's see, this is an example of a similar kind of search, um, looking for works by Titian in the National Gallery of Art. You see there are 18 matches. Um, and here is uh, a, a work of art by Titian in the National Gallery. And this would be the record that you get once you click on one of the 18 uh, results that I showed you on the last page. And you see here that um, there are multiple images of this work of art. And these are brought in not only from the National Gallery of Art's photo archive, but also from some of the other um, photo archives that are in Pharos. Um, and you see here that there's multiple photographs. These are x-rays and different things. This is a color photograph. Um, you see here the back of the photograph. Um, the archivists among you will know that uh, you never quite trust what people put in databases or leave more likely leave out of databases and like to look at the backs of photographs. So most of the institutions have also digitized those. And you can see some handwritten notes here um, by the photo archivist or potentially by art historians that have come in to look at these photographs in the past in their analog state. You see up here, there's a section for image license. You can click on that and see whether this image will be downloadable for your work. Um, there's a compare image um, a tab here, which I'm not going to click at the moment, but I'm going to click search similar images. And this is where the visual search component goes in because you have multiple um, images, this is how these images from the different photo archives were brought together into this one record to show all at once. But the site also uh, produces um, images that are uh, related as these are here. So this is a painting in the Louvre with the similar woman and the man in the background. Um, this is a painting in New York without the man in the background. This is a painting with a different man in the background that's in Prague. Um, so you see here that now you're not only seeing the work of art and all the related images, but you're seeing, um, I mean, the, the actual images of that work, but also images that maybe were, uh, you know, copies or versions or 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 could have influenced the work of art. So that's um, a wonderful aspect of the computer vision element. Um, and just going back, you know, you see the different provenance uh, information here. Um, and one photo archive might have uh, some provenance that another one doesn't have. And so again, that's the benefit of bringing all of the photo archives documentation together into one site that a viewer can see all at the same time. Um, all of the images are triple IF compliant, um, which means that they um, use one common presentation standard. And um, there are certain viewers, uh, image viewers that have been built for images in the triple IF standard. And a lot of, uh, I don't know, most practically cultural heritage institutions at this point use um, use triple IF standards. And this is the Mirador viewer. You see here that um, I'm bringing together a color picture, um, a black and white picture, um, the back of the mount so you could see cl even closer um, and really think about the work of art in a more detailed way. You can bring you know two in or four in or any number that you want. Um, and here is an X-ray and I have circled um, I have circled a hand in the x-ray and I've annotated that at, uh, with the word hand, obviously. Um, and this is a functionality that um, is not currently active, but will be, which is that each user who wants can sign up for an account and then they can bring images together into their account and they can annotate them such as I have done here um, for future use or even to share with other colleagues that they um, that they would like to see the research and the work that they're doing. So these are functionalities that will be um, uh, added on um, as the site develops in the next um, few years. So we're very excited about that. 
Um, of course, if you want to do a simple, I'm trying to make sure I'm in the right place, a simple search, I now go backwards to the main page. Um, you can do that. You can look for artwork, photographs, artists, photographers, put in different words here. Or if you're just visiting the site and you just kind of want to browse, it looks sort of interesting from what I'm saying, you can browse the collections and click on artists or photographers. And there's more, but it doesn't all fit on the web page to show you um, <laughs> uh, in a slide here. Um, and so I picked um, artists. And um, this is what you get when you click on the artists. And you see here the filters are on the left. Uh, there's a filter for gender, so I clicked female. Um, there's a filter for nationality, so I picked uh, French. So they found 80 matches for French female artists in the database. Um, it says, please note, presenting only artists with artworks. So in other words, there are artists in the database that do not have artworks, but that we found that to be very frustrating because you'd be like, oh good, I found a 16th century Spanish artist woman that no one's ever heard of, but then there would be no images to show. So we made sure to do this. Um, there is a, a birthplace and death place maps available for each artist. Um, so in my search, I chose um, Elizabeth Vigée Leblanc because we've all heard of her. Um, and this page is our um, artist uh, page, if you will. Um, and it shows information from all of these repositories. These are four Pharos repositories. And if you click on each one, you'll see which Pharos repositories information comes from. And these are the outside uh, uh, authority files, the, um, the Getty, the VF, Library of Congress, the Deutsche National Bibliothek that the information comes from. So this is where the data sets of the institutions on the left and the external databases on the right comes together in something like this. And this allows us to do these granular searches for women artists um, of such and such a nationality. You could even do born before, all kinds of different, very granular searches. Um, and it's because, I mean, while you might go to the Frick and not find that Elizabeth Vijay Lebrun, in case you didn't know, was a uh, even from her name, uh, a female artist. Um, but the Getty, for instance, has that information in its database. So this is the benefit of linked open data. You're taking open data sets, bringing them all together so that they can share the information within. And obviously the benefit of the computer, because just looking at a photo archive uh, analog in a library, you're not going to necessarily have all this information at your fingertips. Um, so uh, further down the page, on the main page of Pharos, you can see that we also made some sort of pre-built searches for, for you that you can look into and kind of see how it's done, but also what the kind of results are. So we have here red chalk drawings, um, which will bring up all the red chalk drawings that are in the on the on the in the database. Um, built works, uh, women artists, self portraits, bronze sculptures, um, and here is AC Cooper photographs because, of course, as I mentioned, uh, photo archives contain photographs of uh, by photographers, and not all, but many of the um, the institutions note the photographer of uh, the work of art, if known. And of course, that's of interest to um, photography historians. Um, and you see here, A.C. Cooper was a firm that was active in London in um, from the 20s through the 60s, um, documenting uh, works of art that went through the auction houses. Um, and many of the Pharaoh's institutions have photographs um, by A.C. Cooper firm. And um, here you see that in the database currently, there are 21,395 21, um, A.C. Cooper photographs that you could um, look at. And you see here, there's also a, a tab for you can look at all of the matches or if um, they include a photograph. So you can look at all of them, but some, in other words, some don't have images um, that go with the record. And um, in this search, I made sure that um, you include, you do indeed include the photo. Um, so now I'd like to show you a little bit about the um, visual search. Um, and you know some of its benefits and how it works just a little bit more. Um, this is uh, another painting by Girolamo de Benvenuto of the Virgin appearing to the patrician John and his wife. And you see here 
so many photographs from the different photo archives that are attached to this record. Um, you see, uh, this is, you know, a nice color photograph of this work from Itati. This is the, down here is the back of the painting of the panel. Um, you know, if you went to the Frick's photo archive, you would maybe only see, I'm, I'm not meaning to diss the Frick, I'm just saying to another one photo archive might only have a black and white of this image, but by bringing them all together, you have the color, you have the, the back of the mount, back of the actual painting. Um, Further down, you might have the back of the mount or the back of the um, photograph, as I showed you earlier. You have detailed photographs. Uh, and so you're bringing everything from all of the photo archives together like that. Um, and all of the information, so the different way the names are spelled, and as I mentioned, the different uh, provenance that the different institutions have. Um, and once we have this record all together with all this information, all of the uh, photographs attached to that work of art, we actually make um, a canonical uh, Pharos URI for that work of art um, so that that can be used in other data sets with other linked open data projects. Um, I also wanted to show you the, um, this is another aspect of the visual search in Pharos and it works somewhat, I don't know if you've used Google Images, um, but uh, it works somewhat like that. You can upload a, uh, an image using a, a URL or drag and drop from your computer. And it uh, Pharos will automatically search its database to see if it has any similar or related images. Um, and what's nice about that is for art historians, I mean, Google images might give you, might give you the painting, sometimes it does, um, but you know, it doesn't, it also gives you a lot of other stuff that you don't necessarily want. And it also gives you images with metadata that hasn't been um, reviewed by um, our historical institutions such as participate in Pharos. So this is more, even though sometimes this uh, site or the institutions might not have completely updated information, it is like, it is going to be more accurate than much of what you find on a site such as Google. Although of course these things do um, progress um, as time goes on, but um, that that that's another benefit of, of Pharos. So, um, again, what, if you don't know about, you know, photo archives um, having all of the photographs from all of these websites together um, obviously is of a benefit to art historians uh, just because, um, you know, it's obviously more is available. Um, the, they might have, uh, this is say the Frick has images of lost, stolen, or destroyed artworks. Um, so that, you know, there a Frick photographer took a photograph of a work of art that was subsequently burned. And so it might have the only image of that work of art, but uh, the Zeri Foundation doesn't know about that work of art. Um, but once they're all combined in Pharos, you could, you, you know, a researcher um, would be able to find that work of art. Obviously, it makes it easier than having siloed data sets for each of the photo archives where you a researcher would have to go to each of the institutions. And especially as we add institutions, it's gonna make it um, more and um, much easier and, and more beneficial for researchers to use this platform. Um, also works of art change over time. They are, and people don't usually think of this, but they are physical objects. And so you could have, um, let's say this Madonna and child here, um, someone could come and, you know, paint out the child that's happened in a number of works, or you could add a little angel. This has actually happened, and we have documents of 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 that in the photo archives. Um, and the and again, the Zeri Foundation might have, uh, you know, a painting with a little angel in the upper left that was subsequent in 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 a photograph from 1920 that was subsequently removed. And the Frick has that photograph later because now the painting has been moved to the United States and the Frick took a photograph of it without the little angel. So people don't often think about how um, paintings uh, well, I mostly stay the same, but they, they, a num, you know, they do occasionally change or someone kicks them or throws acid on them. 
Um, there's also conservation photos and not every photo archive would have an image of that. But again, that's the benefit of a combined source like this. Um, and also, as I've sort of mentioned, um, the metadata that's in there includes information not only from photo archivists who've done research in, in, in books and catalogs and online sites, but also from art historians that came in to each institution over the years and um, provided new attributions, provided new source of provenance. And obviously, the Frick doesn't have all the data of uh, Federico Zeri, because that's in, that's in the in the Zeri's photo archive, and vice versa. The Zeri doesn't have all the information of, let's say, Everett Fahey, who used to come into the Frick photo archive and make annotations on our um, Italian paintings. So again, you're you're able to um, combine um, data from the different sites that would not otherwise be available. So in order to do this. Um, digitally, um, we did add to the site in the upper right, when you get a result like, like this, let's just say this is Francois Giradon, um, of exporting CSV files or exporting JSON files. Now, currently, um, those are not producing information that's useful <laughs> for our historians. You're, you're welcome to look at it. It's going to be, it provides the URIs of the images uh, of the works of art. Um, but we are currently working on that. We have a digital art history research group that Samantha is part of, um, and they will be um, fixing those fields so that they actually reflect uh, information that will be useful for digital art historians to download the results of, of, of data um, that they have um, brought up onto the site. Um, so that will be useful to use. And now what I'd like to do is, um, just show a, I have to stop sharing. And then I'd like to show um, a website of a, sorry, um, of a digital art history project, which is not coming up, unfortunately, um, that, um, sorry, I don't know where it went. I'm just gonna have to go off for one second. Um, this is going to, this is a website of a student who used um, data from the Kunsthistorische Institute in Florence, which is one of our partners. I'm not sure what you're seeing now. You're just seeing, okay, here it is. Um, he, they did not use the Pharaoh site, but they used the data from one of the Pharaoh's institutions, the KHI, the Kunsthistorische Institute in Florence, to do a digital art history research project. Um, the project was um, studying the donation of Ludwig von Berkel, who was an art, a German art historian, um, who gave, I think it was something like 435 photographs to the Kunsthistorische Institute in, I believe it was 1912. Um, and what was the, this is the research questions that the student wanted to answer. What was the impact of this donation of photographs on the collection of the Kunsthistorische Institute? Um, and so this is, it goes down, it's very nicely laid out and um, discusses the project that I just outlined. Um, it gives you, as any good digital art history project would, a, um, a bio biography of the subject, Ludwig von Berkel. Um, it talks about his collection, his photograph collection. It talks about the Kunsthistorische Institute. That's a beautiful photograph of the Kunsthistorische, which is, Kunst is actually one of the oldest um, photo archives uh, on the Pharaoh's website. It was established in 1897, as you see here. And this is the um, acquisitions um, book of the of, of the photo archive, um, the Kunst. And um, then it shows some highlights from these collections um, given by Ludwig von Berkel, which is also very nice. It's very nicely done. And I think Samantha's posting the URL of the of the site, um, so you can look at it yourselves. Um, and talks about the impact on the overall collection, impact of uh, 
specific photographs. She did a data visualization of the year of distribution of the photographs. Um, data visualization of paintings with individual photographs. So she found that um, that um, a third of the photographs he donated to the Kunst um, are not otherwise um, represented in the Kunst. So without those photographs that he donated, um, the Kunst would be less rich. Um, this shows paintings that are either destroyed or missing that he that he donated images of, as I was talking about before. Um, this is the chronological distribution of the photos, and it shows here these little red triangles show that um, his Burkle's photograph was the first photograph of that work of art in the collection. So it sort of started off the existence of that photo photograph in the collection altogether. Um, and then she did a nice map of the artist's um, uh, origins and the number of photos per artist, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to show you that as a kind of example of using, of downloading data from one of our partners um, and, and using them in, in a digital art history uh, project. And um, this will, of course, just, uh, you could, the numbers of things that you could do with so much more, uh, you know, the data from all of these institutions and together is obviously a lot richer. And as we grow, um, we'll be continue to be richer and richer as time goes on. So I think that that is about all I have to present today, but um, I hope you go on the site, try it, give it a little bit of um, leeway, as I said, because it is a pilot project, it is a beta platform, but I welcome you know feedback on the site once you go or questions. Um, as I say, I think Samantha put my email in the chat. Um, and I do anticipate some kind of opening for the new site, which is faster. We have a new server. We have a new um, computer wizard working on it and um, all kinds of good things. And that will be um, in the fall. So we look forward to that. And I welcome questions now. Thank you so much, Louisa. And we will definitely have you back in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> also with some um, exciting uh, new features that I'm really excited about, but won't say anything about now. Um, okay, first question. And I think it was answered in your presentation pretty much, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Um, how does Pharos differ from ArtStore, which is merging with JSTOR? Um, yeah, it, it um, this is one of the questions we had to answer in our grant proposals. Um, ArtStore doesn't bring together um, all of the records into all of the photographs of one work of art into one space. It, it hardly brings together works of art by the same artist, as far as I know. It's very hard to use. Um, it's much less user friendly. It's um, it costs a lot of money. I don't know if any of you noticed. Um, I mean, of course, you can use it at different institutions. This will be free to all. That was one of the um, uh, rec not recommendations, requirements um, that we set out at the beginning in 2013 and also requirement of the Mellon and the NEH. So all of the images that go on the site, while they might have specific copyright restrictions based on um, agreements made with owners of the works of art, that does come up. Um, the, the images are also free to download and use and um, so that's very different. And but the main thing for me in terms of usability is that, you know, you don't know. It does not bring all the artworks together, all the photographs and information about one artwork together in one art record. So you'd have to look all over the, the site. It's like having multiple databases stuck into one site that don't interact and ours interacts. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think that was an early on question. Um, so the next question, this is from Darlene Bialski. I'm saying her name, sorry if I butchered it, because she says your name. Thank you, Louisa. <laughs> this is amazing. And now so much more involved than the introduction webinar she attended a few years ago. When you show a record, which is multiple thumbnails below the text, is there a way to know that the thumbnails appear are all attached? In other words, um, should you presume that all thumbnails visible are that have thus far been attached? 
would it be helpful to know would it be helpful to know if the user particular record where there are multiple images i guess it does it does it are you i'm not all of the images below the work of art like i showed that's particularly that um that late last Italian one that had so many, they're all images that are connected to the work of art record um, by the individual institution. So once we've connected, uh, once the image search or the data search has made the connection between these images and our records, everything that shows up in the Pharaoh's record is related to that, um, that work of art. They're not gonna be like, I did show you that there's a tab that says related images, which means copies or versions or, you know, derivatives or something that the image search function was like, look, this is very similar. That one I showed you of the woman with her hand like this with the man behind him, her, um, for instance, you saw the ones didn't have the man, et cetera. So those are the related objects, but everything in the record itself is related um, by, um, by the technology to that work of art. I have another question, anonymous attendee. Are there 20th century artists or are there only the old masters? The site, I didn't really say this, at the uh, moment documents mostly Western art, um, art in European and or American or European American influenced art. Um, because that's what these 14 original institutions had in their collections. And as I said, that helped the 14 original institutions kind of look at their collections in this day and age and sort of see like, are these, you know, dinosaurs and relics or, um, and what could be added? Um, there are, that said, there are 20th century works of art. It depends. Um, you can look, you can use the filters to look and see how much there is. The Frick, for example, stopped collecting, um, did not collect works of, photographs of works of art by artists born after 1920. Um, some of the others do um, collect works of art by 20th century, but to date the images we have brought on are of older art, old masters. I have a question from Emily Stein. Now that Pharos is a certified nonprofit, association, will the domain become a .org? Um, I think that the, it will, it will, <laughs> um, it was a .org. We had, uh, I think you could find it on site online still, I think pharaohsartresearch.org. Um, it, it had to do more with what was available and, um, yeah, so I'm not sure about that. I think that the URL is actually going to, the domain is actually going to change with this new site that's coming on. Um, so stay tuned on that. But as I say, it has it has been a .org at one point. Okay, here's a copyright uh, question. If you find an image you want to use for a publication, can you use it or are there copyright issues? Okay, so when you find an image, as I showed you there, um, you have the image and then you have the three little tabs at the top. So the first one I think is image copyright. So while this function also is not working terribly well, um, you can click on that link, image copy, this is the, the plan and um, it's somewhat implemented at the moment and see that there'll be what, what kind of um, uh, Creative Commons license is applied to it, um, whether you can download it, what size you can download it. So that we're trying to make that very transparent on the site. All of the metadata, just so that you know, is um, is CC BY, which means that you can just use whatever um, information that's on there. The institutions have all given their permission, but the images have some restrictions um, that, that uh, based on their, as I said, the relationships with um, uh, donors of the photographs or owners of the paintings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're trying to spell that out very carefully and, and each actually each image will have a license attached to it. So it'll tell you um, whether you can download it and what size. Great, thank you. Um, I guess we might've broke the website. People are saying that the URL is not working. So um, hmm. just try back in an hour when we're not all trying to try it at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, that'll be better in the fall. 
Um, I have another question. This is from Laura Fernandez. How do you? I'm actually getting in, so I don't know why people are having that trouble. Are? Yeah, I just, I'll I just, read I'll put I just it in got again. in, so I don't, I don't know. I just tried and I got in, so I and I, I don't have a special entrance portal. I'm just, okay. uh, yeah. Oh, same working here. Someone says, yeah. Okay, I'll just repost it maybe. Um, when I'm done with this next question. This is from Laura Fernandez. How do you decide which collection or institutions to reach out to? There are so many. Is there a place to see which institutions participate? For example, Hungarian institutions, some are very small, but very valuable to Central European art research. Okay, currently there's only, well, there's actually 15 institutions on, um, and there is a place on the website, it says partner institutions. You can look up on the upper right on the, on the, on the opening page, it says about us or something, and it says partner institutions there. But also in the um, right there, it's when I said art. There's a uh, artists, photographers. Those those squares. The one on the far right was the uh, partner institutions, and so you can see the fourteen or I'm not sure the fifteenth is actually on there right now, but um, institutions, and you can click on those and find out more about those particular institutions. Um, we decided early on to not bring on any other institutions until we had worked out the platform, uh, uh, you know, until the pilot project was finished. And now we see that there's so much more work to be done. Um, and we're doing things now like sort of uh, making um, protocols for the way, an easy way for institutions to be able to add their data to the site. Um, and, you know, we just sort of started out trying to see if this technology would work and it it has worked, even though it's um, bumpy, like I've showed you and you'll see if you go on the site. Um, but, um, you know, now we're, and we, it's been a slow process, obviously, since it's been 10 years of um, professionalizing everything, first becoming a nonprofit that was not attached to the Frick. We're not attached to the Frick anymore. The Frick you know, attaches to us, <laughs> um, but we're not, you know, sort of, uh, they were originally the ones who took the, the Mellon Foundation grant because we weren't a nonprofit yet, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all these ways of what we're working now on how the, the, the protocols for bringing new institutions on. We have a membership committee that's going to, if you have suggestions, let's say of those Hungarian institutes, um, you know, again, email me because um, we do have a membership committee that's going to, you know, slowly start looking at different institutions and talking to those institutions because there's a lot of really cool underserved um, photo archives out there that Pharos um, could help um, bring their collections online and then really enrich things like small Hungarian institutions would be great because they just aren't rep well represented in some of these large collections that are currently on Pharos. So anything like that is wonderful. We've reached out to... Um, the Hindu and Buddhist art uh, uh, photo archive in California and um, the Yale uh, African, Yale Van Rijn um, African art collection, the, um, uh, the, 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 the African American collection at the Hutchins Center at Harvard. We've reached out to a number of different institutions to sort of gauge of, of, of different types of art rather than Western um, to, to gauge their interest. They're all interested. And so, you know, one of the big pushes is to, to create a system that we can onboard all of these, but we need the system to be stable first. <laughs> there was kind of a question comment. Um, when do, when, when I do a search for the Frick photo archive in Pharos, the images from the Frick do not seem to be integrated. Um, so I guess they're saying not everything's integrated yet from the pilot institutions. I guess, yeah, it's a work in progress, right? Well, the Frick's data and images, you'd have to ask their photo archive um, where that is. We're all integrated. They were one of the first institutions uh, data to get on the site. Um, similarly, um, at, we were actually uh, in the, on the new site, uh, we're actually... Uh, in a way, starting from scratch, the Frick has um, redone its uh, database um, and there's new added information and connections with uh, 
uh, Library of Congress and Wikidata that weren't there when Pharos ingested the data. Um, and they're actually starting to work now with um, the Pharos Metadata Working Group to re-ingest their data. And we're actually gonna go through and re-ingest all seven institutions metadata and go over with the institutions, um, you know, how it's working on the site, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a long process right now. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure exactly why right now the Frick's images, would, they, 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 they have shown up. I'm not, you'd have to talk to the Frick. <laughs> I just added, um, if you're just looking for Frick Photo Archive, I added in the chat um, a URL for our digital collections where you can find those. You can also find them on our OPAC and the library catalog. Uh, I have a question from Alba Arola, who knows us both. Thank you. Uh, hi, Samantha and Louisa. Thank you very much for organizing this webinar. I understand that you plan to add another feature so that users can annotate images. Will annotations be publicly shared in the form of enrichments? They, I think you, you, you'll be able to decide whether you want your annotations to be shared or not. That will be up to the individual user. Right. You kind of put your stamp on it. <laughs> well, you know, some people want to share their information as, as people do when they write on a photograph, the back of a photograph or in a photo archive or submit it to the photo archivists for documentation. Um, but some people don't, as we, you know, it just depends on what the information is and what you're planning to do with it. I think our questions have slowed down or dried up. No, I see a ton in the chat there. Uh, I don't yeah. know. This There's oh. a lot in the chat. I've asked people to use the Q&A. Um, oh, okay. Let's see. How oh, and Moire Mosler says, when will the RKD database be integrated into Pharos? Um, <laughs> not a surprise from you, Moire. Um, <laughs> the RKD, uh, there's three institutions that are sort of hovering and about, you know, being um, integrated, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, Yale, and the RKD. So it is hopefully in the next year, the RKD, you may have noticed, Mire has just redone their website uh do not like the new one just saying neither does do they i don't think um i don't know if you've seen it but anyway um because of that we had to put the ingestion of their data on hold um they had to do do a lot of work um and uh we are currently working to uh to they have specific agreements that we need to we have we have been looking at and we have um been working on and are about to be approved by all. And hopefully after that, they kept putting us on hold for the past year. So I, I'm hoping in, the, in in this year, the RKD will go on, Mireille. Sorry to take so long to say that. <laughs> I see another question in the chat. Please use the Q&A. Um, this is from Molly Seiler. How useful is Pharos, is the Pharos platform for researchers of decorative art and three-dimensional objects? Um, there is limited amounts of decorative art and three-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. There is, um, if you, if you, uh, you probably don't remember, but when I had a, on the main page is the browse collections and I, um, you know, there was red chalk and AC Cooper. There was also a section on monu monu monuments. Um, those are 3D, but you could look there and sort of get a, a get a feel for that, um, and, and sculpture, there's also a, a, a pre-done search for bronze sculptures. So there's a certain amount. Um, it's mostly paintings and drawings, um, but um, there will be other things as well. Um, I There was another question. Um, will you be developing an image identifying search in addition to searching with word descriptions? Well, you already have that, right? Well, yeah, we, we already have that. Plus, there are um, really exciting. Um, there's going to be a very they're, they're actually they are working on you could type uh, typing in. I'm not sure how far they're going to get right away with this, but typing in just, you know, your random words into a search and then having it search the images. They're actually working on that because, um, as you know, many of you know, there's just a lot of really exciting um visual search uh, tools being developed at the moment. Um, you know, we, ha we have a new 
API, which is also going to be able to zoom on in on sections of works of art. So let's say, you know, an angel in the upper left and then search the database just for that, um, things like that. So yes, I, I would say the answer to your question, John, is yes. And, you know, in general, all of these images are, um, can be useful for well, at this point, AI has, you know, really taken off, but, um, you know, a lot of uh, researchers have wanted to use the images, like all millions of the images, because they're identified with subjects and things for different AI purposes. I'm not sure that, you know, they haven't contacted us just lately, but anyway, they, it, is a po it is a kind of data set that would be useful for AI researchers, potentially. I see someone's raising their hands. I think we've just, that function's not working. If you could please just put your question in the Q&A. Be grateful for that. Um, uh, here's from Gail Feigenbaum. She says, thank you so much for this overview. Very useful. It's a long journey, but it's now possible to get a good sense of potential, uh, of the potential for research, which is huge. Since I'm working with a Georges de la Tour, I'm going to give this a try after the webinar, but, um, but sorry to see no major French photo collections are partners. Nice to see you, Louise and Samantha. Well, actually, Gail, we have the Inha Shah, but um, they haven't uh, put their images up yet, just so you know. <laughs> See, there's another one. <laughs> there's just someone asking me if to change a link. So the uh, the person raising their hand is Cynthia Altman. Um, let's see if our webinar person can give you the. Oh, here it is, Cynthia Altman, guest. Oh, she's the Yuki Yoi site, Louisa. <laughs> We'll search by image. Maybe this is a common, maybe this is common knowledge. <laughs> well, yeah, that's actually how we, um, that we first discovered the Yukioi site. Um, Lily Pergel sent it, who was now at the Getty. She was at the Frick. She sent that site to me and that's why I would, I, it, it exploded my brain because I thought, oh, this is perfect for photo archives. I live, um, in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and so did the creator of the Yuki Oi site. I don't know if he still lives here, John Resig. And I was like, I'm going to call him up and have coffee. And he, being a person who dealt with, you know, multiples uh, in various collections, i.e. Japanese woodblock prints in museums and galleries around the world, understood that it's very complicated to kind of understand that there's these photo archives of or images of works of art that the image... You know, they might, these same images might exist in different collections and da, 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 da. But he got the, the th right yeah. away and he worked, we got a grant from the Crest. That was our first one, I think in 2016, maybe, to make a visual search site for Pharaohs. He first used the Frick's images to see if it would work with black and white, because obviously it's very different from the Yuki Oe's, but it worked great. And, um, and we built up on that and we've continued with that. We're using a different, um, search now because he had a connection with tin eye which is a commercial company and as a nonprofit, we had to go with an open source uh site and now we've found one that's even better for us that we're integrating with the crest money that i mentioned with the the, the visual search and Thank it's you. going to be even more powerful so yes very familiar with yukioe.org <laughs> Game changer. We, Louisa and I were looking over that site with such joy. We we're like, thank you, Lily, for sending this to us. It was really amazing and um, <laughs> total game changer for our. Well, it changed actually all of the, the Pharaohs because we, Pharaohs in general, was um, it, it was a sort of down point. You know, it's hard to, to bring together all these institutions and keep people motivated over all this time. <laughs> And um, there was a down point and that, and then we presented that site and they all immediately being image specialists saw the potential for Pharaohs and it uh, brought the interest back up. So, yeah. Super exciting. And we can't wait to see the fall. It's just after one now my time, at least on my Mac. So I'm going to say goodbye and give Louisa a round of applause for, um, for being here today and we will see her in the fall again. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Maybe <laughs> next year. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.